Hello and welcome back to MLab 1101, Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the fifth of our six-part presentation series for Unit 5, Clinical Laboratory Testing. To find the objectives for this presentation, log on to Blackboard. On the left-hand side, select the Schedule tab. Scroll down to Unit Number 5, and you'll find a link for the objectives for this presentation. One of the most interesting areas in a clinical laboratory is the microbiology department. This area of the lab is possibly the most hands-on and requires a great degree of training to be able to successfully identify microscopic organisms. In addition to identification of microscopic organisms, clinical microbiologists often perform susceptibility testing to help physicians identify the best course of treatment for their patient. To better understand the workflow of a clinical laboratory, let's first cover some common terminology. Pathogens, or something that is pathogenic, is capable of causing disease. Communicable means that the organism is capable of being transmitted from one person to another. Normal flora is natural microbial inhabitants of the human body. This could be skin flora, oral flora, urogenital flora, or intestinal flora. Opportunistic pathogens, or an opportunist, can be normal flora, but is an organism that only causes disease in a compromised individual. This could be somebody with an elevated age, or perhaps somebody taking an immune-suppressing drug like chemotherapy. Antibiotic susceptibility testing tests for sensitivity of an organism against various antibiotics, and an organism that is difficult to grow and requires special growth media is fastidious. Because of the innate risk of working in a microbiology department, it becomes important to keep your working environment free of pathogenic organisms for you and your coworkers' personal safety. To do this, we use cleaning agents such as disinfectants, which are chemicals on the surfaces to kill or control the growth of organisms in their active or vegetative stages. An example of this is 10% bleach or phenols, which are typically made up daily as part of routine maintenance. Antiseptics are chemicals used to control microorganisms on living tissue, and an example of an antiseptic is 70% isopropyl alcohol or betadine. And when all organisms need to be neutralized, sterilization can be used to kill all stages of an organism. An example of sterilization includes autoclaving. The subdivisions of a clinical microbiology department include the bacteriology lab, which is most commonly found in most clinical labs, and is the study of bacteria. Parasitology is the study of parasites, virology studies viruses, and mycology studies yeast, fungus, and mold. Collection of microspecimens require the use of universal precautions and collection in sterile and, of course, leak-proof containers. The various sources of microspecimens include throat swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, sputum specimens, stool, urine, blood, cerebral spinal fluid to check for the presence of meningitis, a wound abscess can be collected on various parts of the body. Synovial fluid is the fluid between joints. Pericardial fluid, fluid surrounding the heart. Peritoneal fluid is abdominal fluid. Pleural fluid is fluid in the lungs. And genital swabs can be collected from urethral discharge, cervical swabs, or anal swabs to check for the presence of sexually transmitted infections. The development of bacteriology is largely thanks to German physician Robert Koch, who postulated that microscopic organisms were the cause of disease and not miasma. This is known as germ theory. To confirm the theory, Dr. Koch needed to identify organisms in the clinical lab. To do this, he manipulated atmospheric conditions, nutrient requirements for specific organisms. He identified the morphology microscopically 
He performed biochemical reactions, which are distinct among different species of bacteria. And currently, in most modern bacteriology labs, we perform genetic testing, which identifies specific nucleic acid sequences in microscopic bacteria. One distinguishing factor of bacteria are growth patterns. When a bacteria grows in the presence of an oxygen-rich environment, it is said to be aerobic. And when the organism is capable of growing in an oxygen-poor environment, it is anaerobic. Most bacteria that are pathogenic to humans grow between the temperature of 35 and 37 degrees Celsius, which is normal body temperature. And another distinguishing factor is the amount of time it takes for certain organisms to grow. Some organisms grow much more quickly than others, which is a distinguishing factor, which helps microbiologists identify certain bacteria. The nutritional requirements for bacteria can vary depending on species, and culture media can be implemented to grow most types of bacteria. Examples of culture media include tryptocase soy auger or chocolate auger. A differential media or indicator media can be used which indicates specific growth patterns in bacteria such as beta hemolytic group A strep which hemolyzes blood and creates a ring around its growth or its colonies developing on blood auger. Selective media contains nutrients for specific bacteria such as McConkie auger is selective for gram-negative bacteria. To identify the morphology of bacteria, the gram stain, which is a common stain, can be used to distinguish gram-positive from gram-negative bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria stain purple, such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, while gram-negative bacteria stain pinkish-red, such as Escherichia coli or Neisseria gonorrhea. Morphological characteristics, depending on the species of the bacteria, can be Diplococci, Streptococci. They could be found in tetrads, or in a staph formation. Bacteria can be rod-shaped, as well as vibrio or spirochetes. The next distinguishing factor for bacteria are biochemical reactions. Different species possess different enzymes, which allow for different biochemical reactions. So, in the event that you identified a gram-positive bacteria, you need to distinguish the different types of gram-positive bacteria. It could be a Staphylococcus or a Streptococcus. A microbiologist could perform a catalase test to distinguish these two, and if the colony were positive, then the microbiologist would know that the suspected organism was a Staph species. Next, they could distinguish further by performing the coagulase test, and if the reaction is positive, the microbiologist or technologist would know that the species is Staph aureus. If it were negative, the technologist would then need to distinguish Staph epidermidis from Micrococcus species, which could be performed by the microdase test. If the reaction were negative, the organism would be called Staph epidermidis, and if it were positive for the microdase test, it would be called Micrococcus. In most modern bacteriology labs, genetic testing can be performed, which identifies specific DNA sequences that are unique to certain species of bacteria. These can test for bacteria, viral, or parasitic nucleic acid and are often much faster than growing an organism in a culture media. Additionally, genetic testing allows for the detection of multiple organisms at once. This is known as multiplexing or multiplex polymerase chain reaction or PCR. 
One example of genetic testing in a bacteriology lab includes the detection of the MEK-A gene, which confers resistance to methicillin, and this is found in methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. Additionally, Chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea are often tested together from urethral discharge and other genital samples to check for the presence of sexually transmitted infections, chlamydia or gonorrhea. One such panel that can be multiplexed for the detection of multiple organisms at once includes a gastrointestinal panel, which, cause, which checks for several diarrheal causing agents at the same time, including Clostridium, Salmonella, Vibrio species, Yersinia, which is the causative agent for bubonic plague, Shigella, as well as viruses such as rotavirus or parasitic infections such as Giardia or Entamoeba histolytica. The virology department detects short segments of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, that are encased in a capsid for transport, transmission, and protection. Common modes of transmission for viruses include blood, ingestion, inhalation, sexual contact such as HIV or hepatitis C, as well as skin-to-skin -skin contact. Viruses can be either DNA viruses or RNA viruses, and a DNA virus is composed of a double-stranded nucleic acid sequence, making it much more stable in the environment. Examples of a DNA virus include human papillomavirus, hepatitis B, and the Epstein-Barr virus. RNA viruses, on the other hand, are composed of single-stranded nucleic acid and are much less stable than DNA and much less stable in the environment. Examples of an RNA virus include influenza, the rhabdovirus, and hepatitis C. The next subdivision of a clinical microbiology lab is parasitology. Parasitology is the study of the symbiotic relationship between humans, which act as the host, which are injured and uncompensated by the invasive organism, which acts as the parasite. Common modes of transmission for parasitic infection include blood, water, fecal oral transmission, or ingestion of undercooked fish, pork, or beef. Specimen collection should be performed on three different specimens collected 24 hours apart between each specimen. These are collected in most often a parapack is the most, off, the most common preservative, which is a two vial collection set, one containing formalin and the other containing polyvinyl alcohol or PVA. Parasitology can be broken down into four clinically relevant phylum, the protozoa, which includes intestinal and blood-borne protozoa, such as Entamoeba histolytica, the four species of Plasmodium, Plasmodium vivax, Falciparum ovale, and malariae, each four cause malaria, as well as the intestinal protozoa Giardia lamblia, and the sexually transmitted protozoa Trichomonas vaginalis. The next phylum is Platyhelminthus, or the flatworms, which include Schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma japonicum, Schistosoma hematobium, Tinea solium, Tinea saginata, Diphylobothrium latum, and Fasciola hepatica. Next, we have the phylum Ascomenthus, which are the roundworms and include Enterobius vermicularis, Trichurus trichura, Ascaris lumbricoides and Silostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus, the last two being hookworms. Next we have the phylum which transmit many parasites, the Arthropoda, including the Anopheles mosquito, which transmit the Plasmodium genus we talked about in the Protozoa phylum, as well as the Aedes mosquito, 
the Redubian bug, and the Tsetse fly, just for a few examples. The last subdivision of the clinical microbiology department is the mycology department. The study of mycology includes eukaryotic fungi, yeast, mold, and mushrooms. Common modes of transmission for mycology or fungi include blood or bone marrow, inhalation, ingestion, cutaneous contact of the skin, or subcutaneous contact. Mycology can be broken down into four or three, excuse me, major categories. There are opportunistic fungi, which usually only cause infection when a host is compromised, such as immunocompromise, like what we talked about in the terminology at the beginning of this presentation. Examples of this include Aspergillus fumigatus or penicillium. We also have opportunistic mycosis, which is infection caused by exogenous saprophytic fungi, and symptoms of these infections can vary. Examples include candied albicans, Malassezia furfur, and Cryptococcus neoformans. Lastly, we have systemic mycosis, which infect internal organs and disseminate to other organ systems. Examples of systemic mycosis include Histoplasma capsulatum, Coxioides imidis, Paracoxioides brasiliensis, and Blastomyces dermatididis. That's going to include, conclude the fifth of our six-part presentation series on clinical laboratory testing, and we will pick this back up with the last presentation in this series.